Great, thank you. Well, hello everyone. And um, my slides are up. I can't see anyone <laughs> out there. So um, hopefully we'll be able to have some some interaction here. Uh, you know, I'll try to ask a few questions and hopefully you guys can participate a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I am gonna be talking about artificial matrices. And so yes, I'm a professor in biomedical engineering at NGIT. And so I, I teach courses in tissue engineering, both a senior level and a graduate level course. So, you know, um, so we talk a lot about matrices or what we call scaffolds uh, in, the, in the course. And so really the takeaway here in this short amount of time and in, in an hour, and I know you guys come from a lot of different backgrounds. The takeaway, hopefully by the end of this kind of our lecture is you'll have a better understanding why people use certain materials, uh, biomaterials or these matrices, either in cell culture or as medical devices, you know, what or sort of properties that people are looking for, why they choose them. So that's kind of the takeaway today. Hopefully you'll, you'll get a better understanding. Um, so you've already learned this week um, about animal cells and plant cells, some of the biology and how they interact with their environment, really with the extra, that extracellular matrix, right, in their environment. And with the, um, you know, with the animal cells shown here, there, you know, there's different types of animal cells, kind of you can put them into different uh, classes or types, these the epithelial cells and those mesenchymal cells, they interact directly with extracellular matrix that has certain chemistry, that has certain density, right? And so the packing of the materials uh, in that matrix, and that actually gives those cells a certain function. Um, and so epithelial cells interact with a very dense type of matrix. And then these mesenchymal cells interact with a more loose, loose matrix. And it allows those mesenchymal cells to actually move, right? So they, they get a lot of interaction or communication or feedback from that matrix due to either the chemistry that's there or other types of properties, mechanical properties, things like that. And same with the plant, plant cells. And I think we're, again, you're learning more about that, that plant cell wall as their matrix and some of the, the, the properties there. If you look more carefully then at some of the components of that matrix, um, again, for the animal cells, which I'm, I'm probably more familiar with, um, you know, it's a combination of different things. That collagen is one of the major uh, compositions that are present in mammalian tissues. Uh, there are also other things like these proteoglycans, which are proteins and sugars, and then other types of proteins. And then they directly interact with the cells via various types of receptors. And uh, so, you know, so we are we are looking at then developing matrices that in some aspects may mimic that native extracellular matrix so that if there are certain key functions that we want the cells to have, that we want to ensure that those artificial matrices or matrices that we've developed um, provides that function to the to the cells. Um, and so we keep this in mind. We're always trying to think of, well, how do we mimic the natural state? Okay, the native native state. And then same with the plant cells. Very complex here, if you notice that cell, the cell wall. You've got these fibers that are aligned in different various ways. And then also there's proteins and other types of uh, maybe soluble factors, sugars and things like that that are present. I'm trying to. I'm not seeing my whole screen here. Okay. So like I said, so we so we developed these matrices to try to mimic that, what's naturally seen by these cells. And then ultimately, and so that's really to gain a better understanding of how cells interact, some maybe it's basic science, and in our case here with the center and the, the mechanobiology understanding. Um, but it's also towards developing technologies, right? So eventually moving towards, we can translate some of those matrices we develop into regenerative medicine types of devices, um, as shown here. So one of the first products is or in skin. So I'll talk about some of those products that have been developed. And so that's using standard, a standard type of uh, collagen based matrix. And then, um, but also here, also what's translational is in drug development, drug discovery, 
so we can use various types of matrices, in this case, maybe hydrogels, um, and maybe get, get to a more high throughput type of system where you can look at cancer self example interaction with the, the, um, that hydrogel system and start to screen various drugs that may prevent tumor formation, um, things like that. Okay, so how do we select, how do we select scaffold materials? That's kind of the big, big thing. How do we select certain compositions uh, to go forward to use in these medical devices or in these uh, cell culture systems? And so, like I mentioned, you want to elicit a certain cell response. And that's kind of the key design, you know, criteria there. So defining that matrix based on what do you want to gain from your cells or what are you trying to look for in, in your cells? Um, and so it may be a more single cell type of interaction that you want to study or uh, examine with that matrix. How do you get the type of behavior that you want or are you going to get the behavior you want? Or you may ultimately develop multiple cells and form tissues, right? And so then you need, make, you need to make sure that matrix or scaffold provides enough cues and support to grow tissues, uh, so multi multiple cells. And then there's some other kind of more practical things that you also have to consider. And so when you choose materials, um, can you process them? Can you actually form the right types of design? Will they actually sit in culture dishes, that's kind of a big thing. So you can actually put cells on them. Um, so, some, some, so some of these more practical considerations, does it have the right mechanical properties? Um, and again, that kind of goes back to eliciting the right cell response, because we know mechanical properties will change a cell response. Um, and then toxicity, that's a major one, right? So we can't make, these, make this stuff and then ultimately it's going to kill our cells. So we got to make sure whatever we're using doesn't have toxic effects. So again, from my understanding, there's a, there's a mix of students here uh, in the boot camp. So I don't, I'm not sure what backgrounds you have. So I wanted to just go over some really basic concepts first, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And this will take a, just a, a minute or two, which is uh, looking at, um, you know, what are materials, okay? What are the various classes of materials? And then this will make more sense when we talk about some of the different biomaterials that are used in matrices. So what are the different classes of materials? And, um, okay, so there's basically three major classes of materials. And those are, one is shown here, metals. The other is ceramics. And the other is polymers. So what makes these materials, you know, what makes materials these types of materials or fall into these types of classes? Um, so it really comes down to their bonding, right? So um, how do the atoms interact with each other? And that really defines the class of material that they will fall under. So for metals, for example, they have metallic bonds okay so they have atoms that are kind of close in close proximity to each other that but they have and they're connected to each other through these highly mobile electrons and metallic bonding and so what makes metals unique at a higher level is that they form very ordered or crisp, um, crystalline structures okay so crystalline means they're very ordered okay order meaning the atoms are in a certain position um, Right, and they form these what are called unit unit cells. And so, so uh, in medical devices, metals are commonly used, dentistry, orthopedics, and really what's beneficial if they are prepared as alloys, then they typically remain very stable in the body. So they are resistant to corrosion and they have very good mechanical properties in terms of high strength, um, high stiffness for the applications that they're being used for. Okay, so, so typically they're made into, into these alloys um, in order to keep them very stable in the body. So wide range of material, a uh, wide range of applications. Ceramics, the other class, is um, different in terms of they're a combination of metals and generally oxides. Um, and again, that bond is 
an ionic bond. So what makes ceramic a ceramic is that ionic bonding. And um, so the ionic bonding gives it very high energy. So it's very difficult to disassociate ceramic materials. Um, so your typical classic ceramics will have relatively high strength um, and they, will, they won't really degrade, okay, unless they're designed to. And again, they're very crystalline and organized. So atoms, again, are arranged in a certain way. But you can also have what's called glassy materials, okay, or glass, right? So silica, for example, right, glass. Um, that's different in terms of it's not crystalline, but it has what's called an amorphous structure. So it's a little unorganized, right? So or they call it glassy. And um, so that's the difference here with, with the ceramics. Ceramics, again, used a lot in dentistry, orthopedics. Um, and then polymers, what makes a polymer a polymer, okay? And so, and this is probably more in, important for, for us and what we're talking today, and this is what, how we're gonna, gonna move forward. A lot of what we use in cell culture and a lot of what we use for mimicking a lot of the extracellular matrix is these are polymers, okay? So what makes a polymer a polymer? Again, it's that covalent bonding, so it's slightly different bonding. Covalent bonds here that link these atoms together and form these very long, long chains, okay? Or what they call linking of MERS, okay? So we create these very long main, what they call main backbone chains, generally, and they're consisting of the kind of these carbons and nitrogens, oxygens. They may contain silica, silicon, and that's for maybe forming silicone, which is a rubber, and that's a polymer. Um, so their unique kind of property is that you, you, you can form these lo relatively long chains, and this can vary depending on the size of those chains and packing of those chains, you'll get differences in molecular weight. Uh, so that molecular weight will drive the properties of those, of those polymers. Um, so you may have a more rubbery-like material, have what are called more viscoelastic properties, which I think you may talk more about tomorrow. Um, and so you have more solid, viscoelastic means solid and liquid-like properties. Um, and then you may even become more rigid, okay? And so here you have that crystalline structure, ordered structure that may form, high molecular weight, and then you can get rigid, more rigid or hard plastics uh, that will, will form out of that. So that molecular weight arrangement of these chains will drive the properties of, of the polymers. Um, and then depending on what the, again, the chemistry of those polymers are, you may get degradation or you may not, you may have very stable, stable structures. Okay, and then kind of, I call it a, a slightly different class or subclass would be composites. Composites are a mixture of the both of different types of materials. So various types of classes of materials or within classes of materials, okay? So you have polymers, metals, ceramics. And here you're just trying to improve properties of these materials because you may have a case where, you know, you may have achieve a certain degradation rate or property in a polymer and that would be great but maybe the ceramic chemistry is a bit of benefit to the cell. So you may wanna combine in this case a ceramic, in this case hydroxyapatite, with a polymer, like this PLA or PCL or collagen or something like that. Um, and native tissue are composites, right? So your natural materials are a mixture of different types of materials. So bone is ceramic and polymer, collagen, hydroxyapatite is a ceramic, and cartilage and other soft tissues like tendon, You'll have collagen, and you also have proteins and water and these sugars, the proteoglycans. Um, so it's good to understand what are composites and how those different types of materials may interact with each other. And then just briefly, just to go, because we're going to talk about these materials, what are hydrogels? Hydrogels are just, we call them water swollen, right? Cross-linked polymers. So it's a combination of a solid, and then water. And 
all it is, the polymer gives a stable, a relatively stable structure. You've got cross links. Cross links means that they are forming bonds either within the chain of that polymer or between chains of that polymer, you get some additional bonding and that keeps the polymer stable. Um, so you've got different types of bonds that may form. And then you can do this or drive these cross links through a number of uh, reactions. And so it may be temperature, maybe UV radiation um, or chemical cross links. And then there's different ways of degradation. So these materials will degrade. Some will degrade fast, some will degrade slow. It may happen by water in many cases, or it may happen by enzymes. And so we generally use this term biodegradable or degradable kind of universally because, because um, there's various mecha mechanisms in which materials can degrade, but in general, okay, so there can be kind of subclasses of degradation. But in general, we'll use this term biodegradable for the various ways they can degrade. Okay. So within all these classes of materials, then, you have what are called natural materials, and then you have synthetic materials, right? And so how do you kind of choose what kinds of materials you're going to use for these devices? Are they going to be, what is it, natural, meaning they're coming directly from the animal source or plant source, um, or are you gonna make these materials? Are they gonna be synthetic, okay? Do you actually make them in the lab? Um, and so let's go through the natural materials. And this is a kind of a list of table of various natural materials that have been used or, or kind of or, or emerging as natural materials that may be used in the medical world. And, um, Collagen, uh, as you can see here, is at the top of the, top of the list. Um, we'll talk about collagen, why that kind of is the most widely used uh, material. Collagen, and underneath that would be gelatin, which is just a little bit of a processed collagen. The, um, okay, so collagen, why is that would be, be abundant? It is abundant in terms of in, in animal tissues. And, um, and as I showed in those other uh, pictures in the beginning, many of the animal cells are going to be interacting with collagen and various types of collagen. So it makes sense to use this material uh, because that is, is what normally cells are, inter are interacting with. Um, so we can, you can, what they use in, for medical implants or in cell culture is generally going to be uh, collagen that's going to come from various species. Uh, but uh, you can also use human source uh, collagen as well. Uh, gelatin is just a processed collagen, denatured collagen, and um, will have similar types of certain properties as collagen, but it may be uh, easier to work with um, in terms of processing. Uh, and, and so it is actually used in the food industry a lot, right? Um, in different, um, different types of uh, formulations. And then there's all these, uh, these other ones listed here. I won't get, get into that uh, too much. These are just a little more specialized depending on where they, they're coming from, the tissues that they're coming from. Elastin, maybe that comes more from uh, skin. Keratin is from your, uh, maybe it's outer coating of your hair. Proteoglycans, silk. Uh, silk, obviously, your clothes, <laughs> textile industry, but also it's being developed for cell culture and in tissue engineering. Uh, proteoglycans, that's something that's widely used in devices and in cell culture. We'll talk about, we'll talk about that. It has unique properties in creating like gels, uh, hydrogel-like materials, um, but also you get a lot of cell uh, interaction. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then from plants uh, is the cellulose. And I think that's becoming more of an emerging uh, type of uh, material that can be used or studied in uh, 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 in cell culture if we can modify it. Um, and then some of these other ones, alginate, chitin, chitazan, okay, we'll, we'll talk about. Okay, and so if we get into some, we'll go through this, and again, I just wanted to give you a little, a little bit more of a background because of those here that may not have the Kind of fundamental here, understanding a little bit of the chemistry 
when we talk about these natural materials, many of them are made up of proteins, okay? What makes a protein a protein, right? It's the peptides that are made, that peptides, which are amino acids, okay? So the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. Amino acids are linked together via these amide bonds here that are shown here. They will form peptides. Peptides will then link together and form proteins, okay? Or proteins will have a series of long chains of these amino acids, okay? So those amide bonds or peptide bonds make those proteins very stable. Um, and so they're generally degraded via enzymes uh, in the body. Um, some of the shortcomings though with these, with proteins and peptides that you get from these natural materials is being able to process them, okay? And so that can be a draw, a little bit of a drawback, again, if you're using them for, like I said, devices or cultures, how to get them into the right shapes that you want or have the right properties that you want. Because um, like I said, those amide or peptide bind, binds, bonds are stable, relatively stable. And so you have to use kind of harsh, harsh chemicals to kind of break that down actually kind of reshape them or reformulate them. Um, and then some of these proteins and peptides that come from animal sources uh, may have some immunogenicity. So meaning that they may create some adverse or have an adverse effect if you implant them, uh, or immune response if you implant them in the body. Okay, but again, proteins, peptides, these are widely used. Okay, why? Because they're outstanding, have your outstanding biological properties, okay, or desirable biological activities. Why? Because they are, they are what's in the native tissue. So cells will interact directly with them, um, whether it's adhesion receptors um, or if those proteins, you know, are growth factors, you know, and presenting these factors to the cell, the other receptors, there's a direct interaction to the cells. And so they're widely used because of that. So, so collagen type one really is used most, most widely. This is commonly used for wound healing and a lot of different um, products on the market. Also developed for other types of regeneration products the, um, and used as hydrogels and other types of scaffolding matrices and cell culture. And again, because it's 30% of all protein in the body, right? And so um, pretty much, you know, a lot of tissues in the body will contain this. A lot of cells interact with it. Um, in its native form, collagen fibers have a relatively high Young's modulus, 500 megapascals. And again, if, you, if pro mechanical properties are important uh, to provide structure to the cells or tissue that you're forming, then the collagen fibers in its native state may be suitable uh, for that. There are various, various types of collagen, uh, but type one collagen is probably the most commonly used or abundant, and, and also abundant that you can actually get your hands on uh, to use for these applications. So collagen will come from many, many sources shown here, down at the bottom, tendon, skin, bone, okay? Making it very easy to isolate. So the material is, is available. Um, so when you look at some of the chemistry of type of collagen, and I won't get into this too much, it's a three left hand, these, uh, it's a helical, helical structure, okay? And so the peptides are present there in, the, in, the, in that helix. And so the cells are actually interacting with those, those, those peptides. Um, kind of kind of shown here and and so because of that then like I said the cells interact directly with the collagen and and provides them with uh, cells with a, a certain property um, you can it generally has mild amino reactivity okay because the that primary amino acid is present throughout um, throughout the kind of various animals, they all have the same primary amino acid structure. The um, collagen molecules can form spontaneously. So if you want to form these collagen gels, 
um, you'll get fibrils that will form in, in, these, in this gel-like um, conformation. And then, like I said, you can also increase some of these properties or change properties in collagen by doing cross-linking. Um, so you form these covalent bonds in the collagen, and this will improve degradation because you generally, if you're doing it for cell culture, you don't want a lot of degradation. And also, and then if you're implanting these materials, you want to be able to control the degradation. So cross-linking is done a lot. Um, and then you also can have active groups on the collagen. So these free amines can be present and you can bind other molecules to that. So shown here, like I said, the big property of collagen, why people use it is because of the great cell attachment. Those peptides, integrins will bind directly through various types of uh, peptides and there's various integrins, uh, these beta one integrins that will interact directly. You also get other proteins that will bind to collagen. Um, and here they've got like fibronectin in the background here. So other adhesive proteins will bind readily to collagen. Also, even making the properties of the collagen, improving the properties of collagen. Um, and so that will improve cell adhesion. Okay, and so many cell types have been studied on collagen uh, matrices and have been shown to uh, perform normally, meaning that those cell types will retain their phenotype um, long-term in culture when placed on, on collagen. Uh, it, if processed appropriately in different ways, it will be relatively stable in culture. Uh, like I said, the, but it can degrade, degrade enzymatically. So cells may actually degrade that material. There is an enzyme that they will produce matrix metalloproteases, proteinases that they can degrade. So if we want to reorganize that collagen, cells can actually do that on their own. Um, and they are combined with other materials. So other natural materials will readily bind and it's been used or has it continue to be used for skin repair, um, can be combined with synthetic materials to form these hybrid materials. We can improve properties and collagen can be combined with growth factors. Okay, and so that will really um, also promote their function. So again, like I said, skin, app, this Applegraph product on the market is made of type one collagen and it's formed into this like matrix here. Um, and they use skin cells on this material, fibroblasts and keratinocytes, and it works reasonably well. So it's approved for ulcer, uh, treat, treatment of this venous ulcer, uh, ulcers. The, um, in cell culture, it's widely used as a hydrogel, as shown here, collagen, this collagen hydrogel matrix. Different cell types are placed on it, and again, over time, will start to form their own structures, kind of embedded in the uh, collagen hydrogel. They will reorganize that uh, hydrogel um, uh, to kind of suit, suit their needs, and cells will form their own, will remodel and form their own structures, as shown here. Okay, so collagen is really the number one. These other ones are either, some of them are emerging or also commonly used. Again, it depends on some of their properties. So polysaccharides are kind of the other, other natural materials that people are using. Um, these are sugars, okay? For, you know, for the most part, they are sugars uh, and they will consist of, again, fairly long chains of glucose and fructose are kind of the common sugars that are in there. Um, and again, they do regulate cell function, but in a slightly different way, okay? And I think it's poorly understood what their, the properties are of, of polysaccharides that will regulate some, some cell function, but um, we'll, we'll get into that. So the natural polysaccharides, like I said, are extremely large. Okay, they will have relatively large uh, or can have relatively large uh, chains as well as molecular weights depending on how they're, they're made. So cellulose is kind of the main one uh, that, again, plant-derived cellulose as shown here. Um, the only, I would say, with cellulose, okay, 
chemistry very simple here, right? Sugar is here, glucose. The only um, thing about it is that in terms of benefit, it's very tough. So cellulose in fibrous form, very strong mechanical properties and it's uh, fibrous in nature. So if that's the type of application that you need, then that's great. Um, but in its native form, it is non, non degradable. So again, as a stable structure for cell culture, it may be fine to use. Uh, for applications like implants and things like that, it's non-degradable in its native form. Um, and so that's why, in terms of its wide use, it's been somewhat limited. Uh, but it's been modified. You can put methyl groups on, you can put other types of group, uh, groups on it, and then that will change some of its uh, handling properties as well as degradation. Um, so the more widely used uh, polysaccharides uh, in cell culture and in kind of implants are the glycosaminoglycans. And so those are sh kind of shown here. These disaccharide units, meaning they may have two different types of, um, uh, you know, sugar units that are, are present here. In this case shown here, uronic acid and this amino sugar hexosamine. Um, and so this will form in the body. It will maybe also couple to a protein. Uh, so what's called a proteoglycan core protein. Um, or it may be sitting by, you know, you can look at, it, look at it as by itself just as a sugar. So the chondroitin sulfate and the heparin sulfate are just the sugar component. Um, hyaluronic acid is also a very large, a large glycosaminoglycan. Okay, and this is a charged polysaccharide. It is negatively charged or anionic. And that negative charge may be of benefit. And so um, you can create hydrogel-like structures out of that very easily. Um, and you can isolate it. You know, it's abundant in terms of you can isolate it from natural sources like roost rooster combs. Um, but you can change its properties pretty easily form these hydrogels or even viscous, viscous solutions based on molecular weight. And, um, and or you can heavily cross-link it, increase the molecular weight to even form solid forms. Um, so you can create particles, membranes, these sheets. Um, again, it's an enzymatic degradation that occurs on uh, that material. Um, so in terms of properties, it generally will have, unlike collagen in its native state, where you can really go up to high, you know, Young's modulus, potentially, um, hyaluronic acid and these sugars don't have that large range or high, high stiffness as, um, say, say, collagen fibers will. So it has a limited range of mechanical properties. It's going to be on the lower end of more kilopascal types of uh, mechanical properties. Um, and it's, it's not that clear how hyaluronic acid or these gags work with cells. They do, cells do have receptors for them, but for adhesion, uh, they generally need to be modified, uh, in order to be able to get, say, integrin cells, these integrins to be able to attach to hyaluronic acid and you get cell adhesion out of that. So on the market, there are surgical wound dressings that are made of hyaluronic acid because generally in its native form, like I said, cells are not gonna readily attach to it, um, for example. So it may be good for allowing for a lot of migration of cells into it and so kind of turning over and remodeling. Um, but you're not gonna get a lot of it, 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 adhesive um, problems that you might see with some of these wound dressings. Um, and for cell culture, which I'll, I'll show in a couple more slides down, it is used pretty readily. And like I said, you can cross-link it and add different components to it to get good cell adhesion. Some of these other polysaccharides that are also sought after are chitazan, which is positively charged. It's a cationic shown here. Um, it's got a lot of amine groups here, if you notice. So that gives it its um, more positive, positive charge. And um, that breaks down red to the easy via lysozyme activity and also can be modified into films and fibers. Um, also used widely in different cell culture uh, areas. 
Alginate is another one, uh, negative charge polysaccharide. What makes alginates pretty e uh, easy to work with is that you can cross-sync it using calcium. And so in terms of ease in the lab, just mixing this with calcium, you get a relatively stable hydrogel that you can, uh, you can use. It, it does come from seaweed also, so um, it's readily available. Um, but again, with these, these types of materials, they, again, don't have these peptides present. So adhesive peptides that cells can interact with. Uh, so you generally have to add, add that to those, to those gels. Um, okay, so in the culture setting then, this is generally what you see. And this is actually a figure that comes from one of the uh, faculty fellows of this, uh, of this center, uh, Jason Burdick, and so um, from one of his publications. And so shown here, um, you know, they show hyaluronic acid, collagen, and alginate gels that are used in the 3D culture. So all of these can really be modified um, to incorporate and kind of selectively incorporate what you want to, um, you know, have the cells interact with. So if there's specific, if you look here under A, if there's specific peptides that you have defined um, that are going to, you know, um, peptide sequences that you know will interact with your specific cell type via the integrins or other mechanisms, then you can add that to these to these hydrogels. So you basically are working with these natural materials that you can modify according to, you know, you can define them according to what you want them to be in the, in the soil culture system and study that. So you can put peptides into the structure, you can put whole proteins into it, you can modify how they degrade and um, via, and it can be, like I said, naturally it's via enzymes, but you may want to also have them via hydrolysis. Um, and then you can cross-link them in various ways, which also will play a role maybe on degradation. And so cells will readily, can readily be sitting into these gels um, they may act, you know, a lot of people use them as an encapsulate uh, type of device or st you can study them that way. And so they're not really integrating with the hydrogel. They may be more rounded in shape like shown here. Um, or like I said, you put in peptides and other types of things. Uh, um, and then they may elongate and stretch, uh, stretch out on these materials. And then you can change mechanical properties based on that. Okay, any questions? I'm gonna stop here. Um, it's a little different for me giving this talk from the go-to meeting platform. So I feel like I'm talking just to myself. So before I get into synthetic materials, any questions about just natural materials and, and before I get into synthetic materials? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I see you. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so it depends on, again, it all, all depends on what you're looking for. So you mentioned matrix gel. I actually didn't talk about that. So matrix gel is actually derived from tumors, right? It's kind of the matrix that surrounds or makes up tumors. So it's actually rich in growth factors, various other proteins. Um, and so when you use matrix gel, say, in cell culture, it works extremely well because it's got all these additional factors in it. But it's very poorly defined. So if your studies, meaning that you've got a whole, you know, laundry list of growth factors, and so you may be getting a lot of benefit out of your cells, but you actually don't know what factors are controlling that. Um, and also because it's tumor derived, if you want to use that, if say for translation, uh, you can't use it. FDA won't allow you to use that material. 
uh, for implantation because it's because of that tumor. The um, so again, it depends on what you're trying to do. You know, so matrix gel is used a lot because we know it's very potent at driving uh, differentiation, proliferation, you name it. Um, the synthetic materials, which I'm talking about now, and I'll kind of quickly, I'm looking at my time, I'll go through that and some of those processing. Synthetic materials are more, more tailored. Uh, and so if there are certain properties that you want, you may just want mechanical properties. Okay, so these are, I would say, like a cleaner system where you don't have all these additional factors present. And if you're just looking at the property of mechanical properties, how that drives cell function, then those materials would be more beneficial. I would say the, you know, the main, the main thing between why people may choose a natural material versus a synthetic material. Natural materials are great in terms of, you know, that is what you see in the body. But when you try to isolate them, um, you may have batch to batch, batch differences, which is a big problem uh, because you may have some high molecular weight, some low molecular weight. You may not have a pure formulation. And, um, and it's also expensive, right? So collagen and some of these other materials, even the hyaluronic acid, is not cheap to use in culture and as a device. So synthetic materials have this extra benefit in that you can make them relatively inexpensively and also really tailor them to the way you want them to be. Um, okay, hopefully that answers. So in this, I'll go back to the presentation here. When you talk about synthetic materials then, and I'll, Here we go, okay. For the synthetic biomaterials, I'll just briefly mention the glasses or ceramics. I'm not gonna, actually I'll probably skip through that because we're losing some time here, but the ceramics and glasses mainly are used, you incorporate them um, if you're really studying bone cells, right? So because bone, is its native tissue is going to be hydroxyapatite. Some percentage of that is going to be mixed into collagen. Generally, people are going to use ceramics or these bioactive ceramics in matrix materials to give you that calcium and phosphate source because that calcium phosphate will drive cell function, bone cell function. Uh, so generally, there's a whole group of synthetic ceramics uh, available to you that are calcium phosphate based. And so that'll be the hydroxyapatites, the tricalcium phosphates, and then these glasses, the glass ceramics uh, that are widely used. So I won't, I won't go into those. Those are, those are unique in terms of structures and the way you can make them. Um, but they're very, uh, you know, potentially reactive when you put them in culture or as implants, releasing that calcium phosphorus that helps the cells. So in terms of synthetic polymers then, okay, um, what is available to us? And there really isn't a whole lot, okay? So what you've probably been learning in the labs is what you see that people are, are using. Um, so limited number of available, I'd say uh, degradable polymers that we use for translation as medical devices. And so a lot of you know, studies are really needed to develop new ones. Um, and mostly the limitation here is because, you know, you got to prove that these things aren't going to kill cells. So in this, when you synthesize polymers, you lose a, use a lot of reagents. Some things can be toxic if they're retained. And, and so, um, you know, developing synthetic polymers over the years has been quite limited for, for biological applications because of that. Um, for cell culture, like I said, there's a variety of polymers that are used, both degradable and non-degradable uh, formulations. So the most widely used ones, I would say, are these more rigid synthetic uh, polyesters. And these can be fabricated using a variety of techniques. So what are they? These are the, you know, the polymers that are used for sutures. Um, and so these are the polyglycolic, the polylactic, and the polycaprolactones or caproic acid uh, materials. And 
they can be stable or relatively stable, or they can degrade very quickly uh, via uh, hydrolysis, so water, um, or and then eventually be removed by cells, uh, cellular degradation. And so depending on their chemistry, uh, size, surface area, and things like that, that will control degradation rates. And then also mechanical properties will depend on really how they're processed. And so there's various techniques uh, for that. And so there are products on the market as well, skin. These are kind of the first products, but there's others. Uh, again, in skin, skin are the early products that use um, these polyester materials. So you can create these sheet-like structures. And so what makes these polymers what they are in terms of properties the polyglycolic acid as shown here it's again these ester linkages that occur coo bonding here and you can have very highly crystalline structures um and this is going because it's so simple in structure this will degrade very quickly okay two to four weeks so usually people will use at least for culture um, and maybe long-term implants, either this polylactic acid or this polycaprolactone, which I'll show in a second. A little bulkier chemistry here with this methyl group keeps it more stable, more hydrophobic. And, um, and so, uh, you know, depending on how you make it, you can use that polylactic acid by, by itself, which would be very stable long-term for over a year, two years. You can blend it or make cold polymers with, out of it with this polyglycolic acid. Um, and so that will help to do, um, increase the degradation rate. Okay, the one big advantage with the poly, disadvantage with the polylactic acid has been acidic byproducts that come out of it. It's the lactic acid that eventually will degrade. And so in cell culture, this may also become a bit of an issue, uh, depending on how long you run your, your cultures. And so I'll get to here. So, so poly, because of that, polycaprolactone has been the main choice that people use for cell culture, because you generally don't have this uh, acid dump that will occur in culture. Um, still fairly stable, will last for a year or two years, so you don't really get that fast degradation. And um, it also has a very low glass transition temperature. So at body temperature or room temperature, it's in a rubbery state. So for again, for cell culture, it's flexible, you can use uh, standard scissors to cut it. And so it really allows for it to be used in a quite easy way, in a practical way. Um, so Many people will electrospin, for example, electrospin the polycaprolactin and uses a fibrous matrix um, in cell culture as shown here. And very easy to do. Um, and that fiber structure, uh, as again, mimics what you see normally in natural tissue, that collagen fiber structure. And so cells will adhere, as shown on this on the you know, right side, this is actin filaments inside cells. Cells are, this is the cell nucleus here. Um, so there's a number of cells laid down onto the fibers. And um, so they will attach, cells will attach readily to that fibrous structure. And um, so it's widely, it's widely used for that, for studying cell adhesion and, and even growing, growing tissue. There are other uh, materials that have been de developed uh, polyanhydrides, for example, is shown here. This is more for drug delivery, so I won't talk too much about that. It is a, it is a relatively fast, uh, degradable, uh, um, you know, degradable material, and a variety of drugs and proteins have been incorporated into that, and it's on the market. And there's also this polyphosphazine, also has this inorganic phosphorus and nitrogen backbone. Um, but again, also has some unique properties this, the, with the inclusion of this um, phosphate. And, and again, it may be useful for certain applications that may be needed. Polyurethanes have been uh, widely developed. And so these are, are becoming more widely developed because you can tailor different mechanical properties as well as some of the now de degradation. And so they have these what are called hard and soft segments. 
um, in the or can have in their structure. And so this can allow for, again, mechanical flexibility in these materials because of that. Um, and as well, again, because of that low glass transition temper, making them kind of softer at softer at body, body temperature. OK. So the ones that we've talked about and ones that you've probably worked with a little bit in the labs as well, these other synthetics, the polyethylene glycol hydrogels, very simple structure that's kind of shown here. And again, similar to the natural material, these polyethylene glycols are what they call kind of blank slate synthetic materials. Because they really, again, cells are not going to interact with these at all. There's no functional groups on here that they would be interacting with. But you can add groups to these materials. Um, and then you get a lot of cell interaction. So what's nice about polyethylene glycol hydrogels is the really wide range of molecular weights, little typo there, OK, that you can create. So you can get a huge range of mechanical properties, handling properties out of these the polyethylene, uh, these polyethylene glycols. And, and so they're generally, like I said, widely used. You can UV cross-link these materials um, in culture and preparation with cells embedded or, or would not. You can add cells later. Um, so very, uh, like I said, routinely used. Uh, the PDMS, which is the pi, which is basically silicone rubber, okay, the polydimethyl siloxane um, shown here, that's used widely. If you're going to use these, this is going to be more rigid-like uh, material because that's used for studying if it's microchannels or microfluidics. Um, this is generally going to be used because you can cast this material and form uh, different channels or different structures relatively easy. And instead of using, say, glass, um, you can use this silicone because it's also optically transparent. And so you can view your cells in real time using this uh, material and, like I said, create different structures. It's got high gas permeability, oxygen transfer. So again, this figure actually comes from another paper from one of our faculty fellows also at Penn. Um, and so you can create these micro patterns, really B and C that uses the PDMS. And so you can either use the PDMS um, as kind of a stamp, and then you create these protein structures that are on substrates. Or like I said, you can create channels, and then you can look at cells in these, in these channels. And then the polyacrylamide gels that the you know, student mentioned there as well. Like I said, again, it's tuning that range of mechanics or mechanical properties. So if you see here, the Young's models can go anywhere from 0 .3, 0 0.3 to 300 kilopascals. And so that would be really a benefit if you're trying to understand what the influence of those mechanics would be. Um, so again, widely used, um, little bit of a difficulty in maybe handling some of it in culture. Usually it's gonna be at, like thinner types of, or sheet-like, gel structures that you lay down in dishes. Um, but, uh, you know, and the polymerization may be a little uh, difficult. But generally, you can buy this stuff and then create the, the culture. OK, so again, widely used, and you see various cell responses based on that. So very low kilopascals. Cells are generally going to be, if you kind of look, are going to be more rounded in shape as you go up into the higher kilopascals of people have shown cells are going to uh, spread out or elongate. OK, so really, that's kind of the driver. Like I said, with the materials or scaffolds that you are looking for, um, you are trying to direct your cells more or less. You're looking for key. Maybe there's key responses that you want out of your cells. So you will choose select materials that will provide those properties OK, or chemistries to drive that function. and I know I'm a little bit short on time here. So just to cover just a tiny bit here about scaffolding fabrication, because this, again, may be important in terms of how to, you know, what would you actually use? And mostly this is for um, some of the natural materials and then also um, these more rigid plastics. You can create these large 
these 3D structures kind of shown here using various techniques. Um, and so these may be more fiber deposition types of techniques. Uh, it can be traditional compression molding uh, techniques to get uniform, maybe it's inner fiber spacing, pore sizes, things like that. That will actually drive also cell function and ultimately tissue formation. Um, so when you create these types of structures, I'll just kind of skip over this really quickly. You just have to be careful in terms of the actual pores, pore sizes and things that you create because that will also drive mechanical properties. Um, so if you have a large pore structure, high porosity, you will actually start to lose mechanical properties in your material. So you have to kind of, there's a bit of a trade off there in um, how much you want to add uh, in, into, these, into these structures. But the three main processes that people are using really for cell culture methods uh, would be electrospinning, the solvent cast, particular leaching, or the 3D printing. And electrospinning, uh, I think you may be learning and or will be seeing in some of the labs, fairly simple process where you apply high voltage to, um, to the polymer that's dissolved in the solvent and you create these fiber structures as the solvent is evaporated. And really what's nice about that is you can control fiber dimension. And so nanofibers usually are big um, because Again, the fibers or fibrils that are native in the tissue, collagen, are on the order of nanometers. As they begin to coalesce together and form a big fiber, then they become on the micron scale. So you can control that fiber dimension and study that effective fiber dimension uh, with cells. And the only real issue with the electrospinning is that you can't control the spacing, pore size, and porosity. So once you make these materials, you know, you're kind of left with, you can control that fiber diameter, but you're kind of left with whatever pore size that you have and porosity that you have. Solvent casting, particulate leaching, it are, is another pretty easy method to create pore structures as shown here. Uh, but the real bit, kind of a drawback here is it doesn't really look like, you know, what you would see, like a structure you would see in native tissue per se. So it's more of like a pore sponge type of uh, network there that you see that you have. So you can control pore sizes, porosity, but it's more like a sponge microscale. And then 3D printing, obviously, here you can get some control over um, geometries that you want to create. And there's various types of methods that you can use to create these structures. Um, but they generally are going to be large, relatively large structures. So again, if you want to get nanoscale features, fibers, 3D printing, uh, unfortunately, up to this date, is, has not been able to achieve that type of resolution. So that would be the only kind of drawback right now with 3D printing, and then also some of the limited compositions that you can use with 3D printing. Um, OK. So more, I'll conclude here. And then if you have any questions, if we have a minute or two, I know I'm running over my time. Uh, which is the scaffolds in general, right, or matrices, the design of those matrices play a huge role on, on cell function. And so you can design them to have different chemistries, but also uh, shown here, those physical features, um, fiber sizes, as well as um, because that, that surface area will then drive how much protein is present on those materials that will interact with the cells. So smaller nanofiber features, you'll have more interaction, um, as well as, again, mechanical properties that are also in those materials will be sensed more readily as you get down to the nanofiber, these nanofiber features. Okay, so I will, I will end there, and then I'll put myself back up again. Okay, so if there's, I don't know if we have a minute for any questions. Okay, if there's any other questions. Uh, 